ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Anne Quito and her futurists. Morning. What an awesome spectacle to see a standing room only room. So my name is Anne Quito. I am a design reporter for Quartz and I am thrilled to be joined by four time travelers or um, visionary thinkers and collectively they represent 57 cities. We did a quick count in the in the back room. So just a warning, our session description implies that we might be discussing the nuts and bolts of construction and fabrication. And we realized when we met, there were no 3D experts or technocrats here. So we will, if you will indulge us, we will gracefully pirouette to a more universal conversation about ideas for the future. I promise it'll be worth your while. So by way of introduction, I thought I would ask each of the panelists to state their name, their organization, very briefly describe what they do, and maybe cite some cities that you've worked in. Let's start with Marcus. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus Joitner. I'm an urban planner, urban designer from uh, Berlin, Germany. Uh, I am representing two organizations. One is my planning office, um, an urban planning office based in Berlin. Um, we're doing all kinds of neighborhood developments, uh, urban design concepts, um, uh, city development concepts um, in Germany, mainly Eastern Germany, and, uh, but also in Lithuania, Ukraine, um, also regional plans like for Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Uh, so it's a work between very different scales from like 10,000 inhabitants to up to 25 million people. Uh, and the second part of my biography is that I'm a researcher at University of Technology in Berlin, uh, where we're working on smart city developments. Uh, and they're not focusing on the technology themselves, but on new planning processes um, and to find ways how to implement smart technologies. And they're putting user into the center of uh, the development. Lovely. Maria? Hello everyone, so my name is uh, Maria Sesternas. I am the former director of projects of the city of Barcelona, which you know that is very famous for um, having very contentious and uh, very strong opinions about every urban project. So when I left the city council about uh, two years ago, I created Media Urban, which is the um, urban content creation agency of the uh, Media Pro Group called uh, Imagina here. And we are now helping cities and governments and uh, developers and citizen movements to engage everyone and mobilize for the yes to, because we believe that city transformation uh, is uh, progressive and that um, the danger is that uh, people tend to mobilize only for the no. So. Uh, we advocate for the yes, for sound investments, for thinking big and um, thinking with um, technology in mind. My name is Ryan Blackman. I'm the VP of Advanced Technologies and Assistant General Counsel at LSTAR Ventures. And uh, I'm leading our smart city and sustainability initiatives at U our Union Point project, which is just outside of Boston. Uh, and one of the questions I wrestle with every day is if you had the opportunity to build a new smart city from the ground up, what would you do uh, and how would you make the most of that opportunity? So our firm currently has 13 projects uh, across the United States ranging from Los Angeles uh, to Phoenix to North Carolina to Boston. Uh, so we've had an opportunity to work in a lot of different markets, um, but we're here today mostly focusing on our Union Point project. Hi, my name is Scott Goodson and I am uh, the founder of a company called Strawberry Frog and we do movements for cities, cultural movements for cities, for countries. We have done Olympic bids. Uh, we also work for companies and organizations in order to create a framework that allows us to um, engage with people to understand what their needs, wants, and desires are in order to tie those back to the city that is trying to build or create a new um, platform. 
um, and by doing so crystallize an idea that they really want and build towards that vision. Um, I'm an author of a book called Uprising, which is all about movements, and we've been in business for 20 years. I've had the pleasure of um, working in Dubai. I launched a city last year called Dubai South, which is a master plan city. Um, we also did the launch of downtown Dubai, which is the place where the Burj Khalifa is um, located. We've worked in Stockholm, Sweden, in Madrid. I am based in New York City um, and excited to be here today. And just a summary, you have an urban planner, an architect, a lawyer, and an advertiser, and someone communicator, someone seeped in the private sector. So this should be a fun conversation. My first question is sort of a stubborn journalistic question. What is the utility of planning for the future? I mean, with the speed of change as it is now, how far could we project? What is, is there an ideal range? How do, you, how do we know that our ideas won't become obsolete so quickly? Anyone? Well, uh, take a stab at it. I think it has to start with the idea, right? The idea has to be a visionary idea for the future, has to be inspiring, and has to allow us to build towards that. Um, if we start only with the construction, then where are we going and why? And if we have all these urban challenges, that we face, what are we solving? So unless we start with what is the problem and what is the big idea, um, I think we're going to be um, in a lot of trouble. So a very practical question, or specific. What trends or social, political, um, cultural uh, upheavals are you looking at or monitoring as you conceive of the future? I think there are lessons from history um, showing that cities that were built uh, 100 years, 150 years ago, for example, Barcelona, which is a city I know very well, it was based upon a dream, which was a social dream. It was a plan that conceived the city as an equal place for everyone, in which uh, planners had to canalize uh, and organize in an efficient way uh, all sorts of infrastructures, all sorts of mobility problems. E and they did it very generously, thinking that this infrastructure would last for 100 and even a thousand years later. Now, uh, as compared to that period of time, now I think the difference is that architects and planners luckily are not so important and there are other people that have lots of knowledge about how a city should be and maybe the difference would be that uh, instead of uh, having a very re um, rigid vision about the city we can design uh, taking into account the factor of time and anticipating many hypotheses anticipating uh, ways in which people will appropriate of that uh, city. And in this sense, technology is great because we can modelize, we can predict, we can uh, analyze and not make huge mistakes that uh, um, cities of the past have, have had. Ryan, you're planning uh, a city of the future. And uh, Scott, so are you for Dubai South. Um, are you, is this... Uh, sort of future, fu the future of future in your mind? Like how, how do you, how, do you, or how are you cal calibrating your vision? Yeah, well, we're looking at our project Union Point. It has a 15 to 20 year build out is what we're envisioning. So there's a reality of today, uh, where technology is today, uh, the current needs of people. Um, one of our first commercial tenants is breaking ground this summer. So there's an immediate need for roads, water, energy, sewer to service them. Uh, but we also have to build to be adaptable because we know things are changing. So uh, one example is um, our parking garages. So we see kind of the future of mobility. We think in the future with autonomous vehicles, fleet shares, things like that, there won't be as much need for kind of single car parking. So how do we design um, our project to adapt for that in the future? So we're designing parking garages, things like that, with already a vision of kind of their second life. So how can they easily be adapted to residential development, commercial development, things like that once the parking's no longer needed. Um, so things like that we're incorporating. So we're kind of designing for today and the immediate needs while planning for the future and making sure it's adaptable so we don't preclude ourselves from the future technologies. 
So I think just your question about what it, it sort of, you know, insight is driving, you know, a lot of these ideas. I think for me, the biggest one of all is humanity in a war with technology. That to me is the overarching issue that we're facing. Um, I, I mean, I've seen Microsoft sign, you know, technology empowers humanity. I think the challenge we're living in, in, in urban environments is that technology has already overwhelmed humanity. And we're trying to figure, the, like the ants trying to figure out like the way. We're missing the big idea that is going to bring humanity back. So Dubai South started with the uh, vision of uh, Sheikh Mohammed 2020, which is uh, to create uh, happiness as the number one objective for the kingdom. Um, the, uh, or, sorry, not the kingdom, but for Dubai. Um, from that came the idea that we will build a city around you, the individual, versus around corporations or banks, um, which is a very innovative idea. So that city, that master plan city, which will be a huge city, um, will be built around um, humanity and human happiness. Um, which in the evolution of Dubai is a very, it, it's, it's a natural evolution, right? Where the country was 30 years ago, you go to, if you were in Dubai in 2007, you saw a huge hole in the sand, and there was nothing there. Now there's the Burj Khalifa and there's 60 huge skyscrapers, and, and you go to Dubai South and there's Expo 2020 has a building, it's actually a like a camper area <laughs> and a few signs, but I can assure you that in 2020 there will be a city there, a logistics corridor, um, a business center, huge residency community, all designed around trying to improve the quality of life for people um, in that city. So two of you represent uh, projects that are being built from scratch. So it's a chance to essentially build a utopia, and two of you are essentially doing a very big adaptive reuse uh, project um, in, in working with 150-year-old uh, plans. What are the challenges and opportunities there? Um, and to Maria, I'm specifically curious, what do we do with churches? <laughs> I'm gonna answer first the first question, which is much easier than the second one. Um, I think, um, I studied architecture about 15 years ago, and um, everything was about zoning, determining density, uh, congestion, um, facade, distances. And um, Barcelona, for example, there's uh, um, something that you might not know. Does someone here can tell us? Um, the general metropolitan plan of Barcelona, when was it written? It was not written 150 years ago, but it's still working today. It was uh, approved uh, 40 years ago, all right? The city in 40 years has changed a lot. There has been democracy, for example. When the plan was uh, designed, there was a dictatorship in, in Spain. Um, this means a lot of things. It means that it was thought from uh, um, 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 a very small group of specialists. Uh, and now the city has huge um, different requirements. For example, those of you who have been in Barcelona might know that before the Olympics, and I know uh, you were involved in the Olympics, before in the Olympics, the city had no hotels, had no hotels and had no land for the hotels. So for the Olympics, the city devoted public land to build those hotels because they were uh, of huge necessity. Currently, the current mayor of Barcelona has banned the construction of hotels because it is thought that uh, the tourism has completely impacted the daily life of uh, people in Barcelona, impacting housing prices and uh, with a very vulnerable society that has not enough affordable housing. Uh, now, the requirements of the new general plan of Barcelona are completely different from 40 years ago. There are issues like um, uh, creating economic activity that is not uh, based on tourism, uh, creating affordable housing, for example, getting a pool of public land to produce uh, this land. Barcelona has, has never had a monarchy, so it doesn't have big uh, pieces of land. 
Uh, so I think these are the issues that my, must be addressed. Concerning the churches, um, my personal view is that they are, this is a perception, yeah, they are being empty. There used to be many people living in uh, churches, so um, they, independently if uh, they are used for religious purposes or not, they should be more open and um, they should maybe be uh, used for people to study, to have uh, co-working experiences, co-living experiences. They're great spaces and they are a huge heritage of the city, so why not? Very cool. I need, we need to talk about that. Here in New York, we turn them into discothe discotheques and gyms. Um, Marcus, please. For me as an urban designer, it's always thrilling to be able to start from scratch and to build new neighborhoods, new areas, and to think how should uh, life should lo look like in there once it is built. But the reality in Germany or the Western world where we plan is the city already exists. There's sometimes like... Uh, conversion and brownfield developments, but uh, even then it's part of an existing system. And Barcelona and Berlin are wonderful examples how cities, even if it's been 150 years back, uh, were able to plan ahead. Even Berlin was the fastest growing city in the world, growing from 600,000 people up to 5 million within less than 40 years. Uh, and still the structure they built there is so robust and uh, adaptable that it can also work in under changing circumstances. Yes, you have a basis you can work on and you can adapt. Um, but even then, existing no no city is the same, right? You have always sometimes you have shrinking cities. Uh, you have to plan for, and even there, also there, you have to keep in mind that these are the cities where people are living in and you have to prepare good living conditions for them also under these circumstances. And then you have cities like Berlin or uh, like Ho Chi Minh City or Mumbai that are growing in different speeds. And if you, from my experience, India, it's very, um, yeah, giving rich experiences because there is the cities are sometimes more than 2,000 years old and the, the structures were not always growing like regular or planned. And if you then go, to, uh, if you then have these all these layer of formal and informal developments and how life is organized there, it's very interesting and it's very, from my perspective, if you want to work in these structures, you have to really um, deal with the, the everyday life to get to know the, the the powers that are working there. And also, if you go to when you're talking about formal cities now, but if you keep in mind that billions of people are living in uh, informal structures or in slums, even there, you don't always have to go there and look through the uh, glasses or with the, with the perspective of urges and needs uh, and, and threats. But these are still uh, living environments of people, of individuals that you have to understand before you uh, interact there. and. Uh, I'm just very curious, can you cite one example of sort of a plan that was hatched years ago that's still very viable now? You mentioned Berlin is a good... Uh, like Berlin and, Berlin and uh, Barcelona's extensions have been made in the same period of time, almost, yeah. Uh, and it was... The interesting thing is that they were always focusing just on infrastructure. It was roads and it was water and sewage. And they built it this uh, a system that was kind of incremental, so that could be added, yeah, piece by piece. Um, and then you had the definition of what is private, what is public, and the public sector built the roads and the streets and the sewage system, and then the private just did the rest. Uh, they provided the homes, the housing, and so on. And it was a learning by uh, by doing process because it created very bad living conditions in the first place because they build it very dense. The living environment, the, the, the inner city quarters everyone enjoys in Berlin today, uh, they have been, I mean, the, the, the houses in the first row are still the same if they are not damaged in the war. Uh, but the inside of the blocks were dense, uh, you can't imagine. It's like uh, within this space there would be like three houses with uh, almost no air, no light, very poor people living there and not healthy condition. But over the times uh, they developed the building codes to, to adapt new uh, knowledge from medical perspectives also to yeah, create healthier uh, okay. systems. Something to add? Right? I just wanted to make a contention with the other side of the table. Um, 
I think if um, I was to start a new city, I would start um, thinking of getting very precise uh, information about the people that live in that city. Barcelona and Berlin and European cities um, are struggling because uh, the public sector doesn't have much data yet about how people live. So, for example, the city of Barcelona knows where people live, but the planning department does not know where people they, um, where they commute daily at everywhere at every hour in real time. Google knows that, but the city of Barcelona doesn't know it. So, um, for the new cities, new developments in Dubai or here in Boston, one great idea that you could export to uh, cities uh, that are more historical would be on how to um, parameterize and get the analytics of how the city works. Um, still in our cities, uh, there is a hidden life, there is a secret life uh, that hasn't been unveiled, uh, that the mayors want to address issues but do not have enough information, and maybe through your experience, I think my experience in Spain, I, not Catalan, but in Spain, I, um, I think um, there's a conservatism in terms of embracing new ideas. So I worked on a project in Madrid where the city was trying to figure out during the economic downturn, which was excessively hard in Spain, how can we attract more people to visit our city compared to Barcelona that has a significant um, larger number of tourists. So we found out that in Spain in particular, but also in Madrid, there are an incredibly high number of female entrepreneurs. As a result of the economic disaster, a lot of men have lost their jobs and women have stepped forward and become entrepreneurs. So what we recommended was a movement to inspire uh, female entrepreneurialism in Europe and to use Madrid as the center point in order to have a conference, to bring speakers, to create a reason to come. Because the mayor and the, the leaders of the city wanted to promote the Prado and Velasquez and El Greco, who, by the way, is a beautiful artist, but, you know, it has, there's great museums in Barcelona too. You know, you don't just go to Barcelona for the art. You have to have other reasons. So, just an example where it was very, you know, the people were very um, uh, not prepared to embrace that idea, even though I thought it was a really relevant idea, for, particularly for the women of the city. You should come to Barcelona and propose it. Next if Madrid time. doesn't take yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's one of the exciting opportunities we see when you say the data and the analytics, is that kind of building it from scratch, we're able to organically integrate the technology into the design of the community. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to collect better da data, real-time data, more accurate data, and not Necessarily, sometimes in cities you can do it on a building scale or, you know, a smaller scale, um, and that's great. But we're looking at being able to do it site-wide. Um, so we own 100% of the development. We're planning on staying in 70 to 80% of it. So we'll have a certain level of control where we can look at the macro data down to kind of the building scale data. So we can use the better data and analytics to actually inform our decisions, make better design choices. Um, and you know, continue as we're developing through the project to make better decisions informed by real-time information and accurate data. So that's one of kind of our exciting opportunities for being able to do it from scratch is really build that in. Okay. Um, you're a specialist in this, but does it, does it have an economical sense? Do you think there is a business case for that? Is it worth investing in this type of infrastructure? Um, maybe we can touch on that on a future question. Is that okay? That's all. I really wanted to make sure we have time for this. The theme of this gathering is powered by the people. And I really wanted to ask, so these are grand plans for our future, right? Design shapes us. But it seems to be coming from a few heads and a few brains. I wondered uh, what role do constituents and citizens have uh, in shaping this future? I want to read a quote from the architect Jeannie Gang. Um, she's, she said this during the 2016 Cities for Tomorrow. She said, sometimes designers are afraid to engage communities directly, including me. I'm thinking, what are they going to say to threaten my aesthetic? But she said later, but there were so many great ideas and things that w I would not have thought of myself as an architect. Now, Marcos applies uh, design thinking 
uh, this tenet, this sort of buzzword, to urban uh, planning. I wanted to ask you specifically how you engage constituents in basically dreaming of their future. So <coughs> the problem with what we see is um, um, in, in Germany you, you're, uh, you're forced by law to do participation. But participation forced. always looks, yeah, you're forced, okay. they are ruled. <laughs> But uh, the participation always looks like uh, you develop a plan and then in the end you show it to the people and say, do you want it or not, and then it's it. But the people can't understand the plans because they are technical plans and uh, um, reports thick like this. And uh, so that's not participation from our point of view. So, uh, and this creates a lot of um, problems in the relationship between municipalities and the people in the end. Uh, and we say that the people are the, not just the users of urban spaces and services and infrastructures, but they are also, in the everyday life, they're, they're the designers of the city. Uh, just like if you take that quote, uh, you can plan a park with wonderful green lawns and ways, and in the end you open it and then you see people are crossing and they build their own paths in the end, yeah? And you as a designer say, oh my god, it's, my grass is gone. So what we, we do in, 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 uh, in uh, smart city development is um, that we engage citizens right from the beginning in problem definition. So not creating a solution and afterwards a problem to apply for, so, but uh, to sit down with people from municipalities, startups, private sector, public sector, uh, and universities uh, to work on to define what's the problem, specific problem, and what's the solution, or what could be the solution, and then uh, uh, do the way, or, or guide them in the way uh, to the solution, and the implementation, and operation properly, because also the people can be the operator of a service in the end, and you get completely new types of business models in the end. And design thinking is one of the methods uh, that we are using, because in product development, state of the art to engage the user of your product in the end and uh, in urban development or urban planning especially cities and municipalities and administrations are really looking for new ways to do this because they have to follow specific procedures and these procedures don't fit with the new requirements of the speed of development and where the individual uh, has to be in focus. Thank you. Scott, I'm curious, you said Dubai South follows the King's vision. Um, how does that include the people? So the Sheikh, well, I think the, um, the, the goal was to, in the evolution of Dubai, you know, it moved over the last 35 years extremely quickly from being, um, you know, a pretty modest Middle Eastern society to becoming, you know, you wouldn't recognize, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between Shanghai and Dubai if you were looking at it from a, you know, hor horizontal perspective. Um, but there's no sidewalks, and everybody drives their kids to school, and it takes an hour and a half, and the traffic on the E11 is very diff horrible. Uh, so there's, there are urban congestion problems that come up when you build a city. However, you know, you probably heard last week that um, Google and one of the sheikhs in Dubai are sponsoring the first um, fly flying car that they're planning to launch in Expo 2020. So you have visionary people in that place who are trying to solve some issues. Now, the cart is, a, is what it is. But it sparks ideas. And one of the challenges, of course, in that region is how do we create human happiness? Not just for the rich, but for everyone. And that is what Dubai South is intended. Now, part of that master plan city is a $40 billion airport that are gonna need a lot of people to work at. And at the moment, if you know the geography, many of those people live in Sharjah, which is the state that is to the north of Dubai. And they have to travel two and a half hours to get to what is the border of Abu Dhabi. So you're never gonna get people going home at midnight, getting up at 3 a.m. and being able to service aircraft. I mean, so they're gonna need to move and build housing and accommodation for people in and around that airport that is going to deliver a certain level of quality of life. And that isn't just a slogan, it is a objective. Um, it is part of the manifesto of His Highness. It's what Expo 2020 will be about. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's a combination of ideas, 
big conceptual ideas that break through the wall of indifference and inspire people, and then it's follow through. Thank you. Right. Yeah, that was actually um, engaging the citizens is one of the first things we did when we got the project. Um, when we got Union Point, it was originally envisioned as like a 2800 uh, single family unit kind of residential development. Um, so one of the first things we did was we put together a group of between 50 and 60 uh, individuals, some from our design team, some from the local towns, um, and our project is actually located in three different towns. Um, so we had constituents from each of the kind of the town governments. Uh, we had citizens who were in opposition to the project, citizens who were in favor of the project, um, and we had a series of about 30 meetings over three months to really see what it was that the towns wanted, uh, what the governments wanted, what the individuals living there wanted, and really helped build our vision from something that was a sleepy suburban residential development. Uh, that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted jobs, they wanted commercial, they wanted restaurants, they wanted entertainment. So as we began to involve them, listen to them, our plans began to evolve more and more um, from kind of a suburban development into a city. And that was driven by them and their desires and their needs. Thank you. If we're almost at our 10 minute mark, but I wanted to sneak in, if you'll indulge me, an esoteric question. So I heard um, that uh, this Dutch designer, Dan Roosgaard, spoke at the UN of the universal right to beauty. Also, Theaster Gates says all the time, if you know him, he's an artist in Chicago developing the South Side. He said, beauty is a basic human right or a basic service. I wonder if um, in these plans for the future, what role does beauty or culture or aesthetics play um, in your thinking? For me, I would transform the beauty into identity because identity is one of the major points that I'm always focusing on. It's the identity of the place that I'm working in that is already there or the place that I want to create. Uh, so the, the people, the places are unique. There has been a huge study of the German government on the um, transformative power of cities and they use the term also in the English version called eigenart. Yeah? It's the unique, uh, unique uh, uniqueness of places with all that could be in design, it could be also how they work and how the people live and do and what, what they do there. Uh, so focusing on uh, identities is very important to me. So I would say um, we should all be thinking of uh, beauty as a diverse concept. Everyone has its own concept of uh, beauty so uh, but there is a common thing that many people find beautiful which is the unexpected and that's what's attractive from cities the unexpected the uh, issue that the city always surprises you this building is beautiful because you would have never thought it could host an event like this and it was designed to be built um, for another purpose so um, maybe being a little bit humble with the planners and architects architect and think that um, the unexpected must arise and that citizens are going to be the ones that are going to be bring beauty to the city. I think, so the Dutch designer, um, if you know him, he designed the world's biggest smog machine. So he collects smog in uh, China and then he converts the smog and pressurizes it and it becomes a diamond. So um, I think it was his way, or it was the government's way, to get people alert uh, or to pay attention to the problem of smog. Um, are there any inspired, when, you're, when you guys are, for, I'm talking to Scott and Ryan, when you are thinking of Dubai South and uh, Union Point, were you thinking of any sort of like surprising artful interventions that might actually lead to something else or more engagement? I mean, the only, there's, there's a, a, these gems of ideas that come out every once in a while. So Elon Musk just announced this idea of putting all cars down under the ground, which yes, the sounds boring like a company. pretty dynamic idea. What's great about those ideas, it just sparks um, a lot of thoughts. And, you know, you could define that as beautiful. It's simple. It's smart design. Um, I think, um, you know, your question about beauty is a, is a challenging one because you know, it confers a certain level of, of wealth mm -hmm. and investment in order to achieve that. As a goal, it's great, but um, you, know, you, can, you can have beauty even in cities that are not as 
um, let's say, wealthy or as um, have, a, have a blank sheet to reinvent themselves. And one, one example is, for example, the Olympics, right? Where the Olympic movement has, for many years, awarded cities that are going to invest enormous amounts of money instead of investing in social programs and so forth. And it's created a dichotomy in the world where cities like Boston are voting when you ask the people, do you want to participate? They're like, no. You know, and they voted against being the city. LA turned around and said, well, hold on a sec. Um, we don't have to build a single building. We can refurbish and beautify our existing infrastructure and take the billion dollars the IOC gives us and actually make a profit. Really smart, right? Other cities are looking at that and going, hold on a sec, that's a different way of thinking about holding an Olympic Games. So beauty can be a um, part of it, but I think it needs a bit of a broader thought about how that is applied. I agree. I, I think beauty is, uh, is critical. And what we've been able to do is we hired some of the, the best design teams in the world, uh, Elka Spanfredi and Sasaki Design. Uh, and we, uh, we allowed them the freedom to create and, and charge them with creating the most beautiful urban environment they can imagine. Um, so once we had that vision, now it's our responsibility as the owner and the developer to, to maintain that division. And so what we've done is we've maintained uh, architectural control. Uh, and we have to be very rigid on that, very stringent. Uh, and we've had to turn people away who weren't able to meet that, uh, but we're uncompromising. So uh, we see the beauty and the architecture and the design as being something that's just, uh, that's critical to the development. Um, and then also, like you said, with it being a, a wealth, um, how do we create beautiful architecture in affordable housing and workforce housing? Those are places you don't always see the highest quality or the most beautiful designs, but what is a new model that we can create and how are we able to do that so not just the, the wealthy can enjoy it, but that it's something that everybody enjoys. Um. Sounds good, and for my last question, I want a one word answer from each panelist. Um, so, so many factors, of course, to consider and we've touched on many of them here, um, but you guys are in the forefront of shaping many cities, many neighborhoods here but I wanted you to complete the sentence, if you can, if you had a superpower. In the future, we will have better blank. We're talking about priorities. Be better answers for... Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, but one word. One word. For me, social cohesion is a very important topic. It, this, will be, this will decide how our cities will look in future. Better co-design, I think. Better co-design, so co -design. engaging more stakeholders in the design process. Right. I, I think I'd say lives, because I think uh, with the technology, sustainability, everything you're doing is really to create a better life, a better it's user cheating. experience for people. Is Sorry. It, uh, okay, fine. I think um, the, you know, why does the city exist? I think the question that has to be answered. One word is, what is the idea? Why? I mean, Better. we know. Huh? Are you saying the answer is ideas? The answer, you look the the word, the single word, idea, because idea. you know cities kind of people gather to defend themselves and they had jobs and now people are living in cities going, like, why do I live here? What is this city about? What's Buffalo for? What is you know Valencia for? What is whatever? It needs why? Why does the city exist? Sounds great. Better ideas. So more ideas here. We are wrapping up. We don't want to hold you from lunch, but if I can ask you to please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Find them. Ladies and gentlemen, the next session on this stage will begin promptly at 1.45. It will be a panel on urban innovation and the environment. Thank you. <laughs>